I was one of them guys that came out of law school and was like, I'm taking over the world. And I came up with at a time when the other individuals, whether they were lawyers or doing other things, we all the same age. So if you look at like Puff and Mark Pitts, who had, um, mm-hmm. you know, it's J. Cole and all those guys now sure. and, you know, Wayne Barris, all these guys out there, Harv Pierre's, we're all the same age. Derek Angeletti, yep, yep. shout out to my client. We all came up. It was like a D-dot. renaissance. D-dot, you know, so it's like you came up in a period where everybody was young and aggressive in what they were doing. And we brought that approach to the the lawyer side. Because when I first started as a lawyer, they were like, man, you I would show up in hoodies, Tim's to a meeting. <laughs> and I'm like, so they started being like the joke was here come the hip hop lawyers. Yeah, yeah. But I didn't it wasn't like I didn't care. I was like, this is what we do. We do it a little differently sure. than what you guys do. Because you wearing the shiny shoes and, you know, the glossy shirts showing up because you've been representing Peebo, Bryson and, you know, and Luther and those guys. We came in like, yo, we representing a new era and this is a new way of how we're going to do business. You're not coming to the studio at four o'clock and to four o'clock in the morning and then hanging out to six o'clock in the morning at a club. I had no responsibilities. So it was like showtime. I was everywhere and I did everything that, you know, the artists did. But I would have done it anyway because I was already in the mix hanging out. I just did what I did best. Got in the mix, hung out and did, you know, and and I'm in I was in the studio. The problem came about when artists that you jump started because we would get them first. They came to us. Then it got to the point where this whole thing became, oh, once I get going, I need to go get a different type of attorney, the white attorney sure, that, sure. that can actually get me the bigger deals. So what happened is we got that whole, you know, you know, pushback of trying to snatch clients. We had a great uh, retention rate, though. Because I was super aggressive. Like, you went after my clients. I'm coming to your office. You got to explain that. Mm. You know, um, and I've had some stories. Like, you know. What that, do you mean? You should just run up and. Uh... Yeah, I've had some stories. I calmed down because it didn't make sense after a while. I, You know, as I've gotten older, everybody grows. I now, this got, is when you were practicing by yourself? No, this is when me and Reggie were practicing. <laughs> so what we, so he was like the the the, the good guy and you yeah, were the crazy yeah. guy? Yeah, so I would get pissed. Like, if I found out somebody was trying to take. Like one time, a client somebody tried to take took his client right after they closed the deal on the other side from us. So yeah. I come in the office. I'm like, "Hey, what do you mean the guy has our client now?" And he's like, "Well, you know, he decided to go." I said, "No, no, 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 get your stuff. Let's go." We went down to his office. I threw everything off his desk, flipped the damn thing over. It was just, but I, I that was my way of expressing, and it was you know obvious unprofessional at the time, but. That was just me having to grow. But at the same token, that's just the way I felt because it got to the point that I realized as long as I was delivering, they couldn't ban me from doing what I was doing. Mm, mm. You know, I wasn't physically putting my hands on people. But at the end of the day, it was you had to show some kind of, you know, I'm not taking it. I'm not a sucker. Yeah. But and, you know, another thing is it wasn't what I tried to explain to my clients. They was like. We have families too. We, you know, people having kids and trying to get going. You're helping somebody else's kids go to school. And the only reason they have this ability to do what they do is because you're giving them your talent. So what you ended up happening is exactly what I thought was going to happen is the deterioration of everything that was built up in our community being snatched as a culture again, and now it's controlled and owned by everybody else. That's why you have lack of black execs in the industry now. You got one black chairman in the industry right now, oh. which is Sylvia Rome. Mm. And she's the president of the company. The chairman was L.A. Reid, mm. who they just let go or he just got stepped down. Mm. So here it went from in the 70s where you had black execs like Larkin Arnold and all these people who ran these companies. You had people who own their companies like Dick Griffey. These guys were actually putting out the whispers, you know, putting out, um, you know, uh, various artists. I mean, they were just killing them and they was developing their acts. They had marketing departments. They had promotion dollars. They whatever. They had black radio mm. money. And then what happened is once our music got so successful, hey, get that back. You know, this needs to come over here. 
the in the indie promotion guys, they started spending more money with in the, on black music. So now all of a sudden, make that go to the pop department. So what you had is basically a a, a, a infiltration once again, and it goes from back to the beginning of time, and that. We we've allowed our our culture to be snatched mm. and, and 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 our assets to be taken, and I'm and I'm and I'm and I'm the one to speak out on it because I don't care. They not nobody, you know. I don't live and die on what somebody else does, and nobody else is paying my bills. I I make my own money, so I'm just I'm just making this point that that's what always fueled me from the moment I started in this business, and I haven't changed. With that kind of attitude, because I always felt it was going to be a problem. But do you foresee it even in now in these days, as you spoke? Do you foresee it ever changing? You know, do you see how could this, you know, be changed to where? I think it's, it's, it, I, you know, I don't think I think it's, it's something that in, internally that we have to deal with as a, as a community to understand when you create something. You know, we used to have. Um, I remember growing up in my neighborhood, all the businesses in, in Queens were pretty much um, black owned. You know, we went to the tire shop, it was black owned, the mechanics. And then once things started changing, everybody stopped using, except for the two things they won't change is their, their barbers and their, uh, and their salons. But now you, they almost changed that too with the nails. They got the nails out of the, so, 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 it, you know, We've allowed it to happen. So potentially the way it works right now, 50 years from now, somebody told me this when I first started, 50 years now, and they, I used to be like, nah, no way. You'll think that rap music was started by probably Eminem. Can you give us some tips on negotiations, maybe for somebody coming up that wants to learn some, not all your sauce, don't give all your sauce away, but is there like a tip you have on a negotiation? That somebody could use an aspiring lawyer right now. Yeah, well, I, 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 you know, I wrote this book called Wood Chips, right? Okay, Wood Chips. Yep. Wood Chips is based on being an entrepreneur, but a lot of what's in there is um, the power to use certain things, the power to listen. For example, um, you know, I remember, and it's, it's a, I share a little bit of this in the book, is where. I used to, I represented uh, a legendary boxing promoter who's, rest in peace, my man, Butch Lewis. And Butch, he told me a story. He said, listen, we were actually walking in an elevator. We just came out of the, walking on a deal, and I started talking. And he told me to shut up. And then I'm like, so I'm quiet and get out the elevator. He said, listen, don't you ever talk on an elevator again because you never know who's listening and paying attention. Mm. And he shared a story with me how years before that, he was years in the past. He was doing a deal, and the he was got in. He went out to take a smoke a cigarette, and two guys was outside smoking a cigarette too. And they said basically, told him like, yeah, they working on that deal upstairs. I said, I think they're gonna close it at this number. You know, I think they should have probably got a couple of more million dollars on the table had they been busting. They, they had no idea that he was the one up there negotiating. He went back up there and basically got. A, the, all the money that they were talking back back on the table. So he said, never discuss anything. And I use that when I say the power to listen. Another thing I always tell people is that, you know, you know, you could be the best running back, but mm. without an offensive line blocking for you, you're not shit. So your team is what makes you win. So it's like going into surgery, right? If you go into a situation you want to basically make sure your surgeon is not doing the surgery by himself. There's an anesthesiologist, there's nurses, there's people who do the checkpoints, all the various things that are in play to get a deal done. So make sure if you're getting into a situation and you do not have the wherewithal to get a deal done, don't try to do that deal on your own. You're gonna, one, you're going to lose your client, right? And two, you're going to not maximize, you you, you you count pennies. So always put your money in numbers versus in percentages mm. because, you know, people get caught up. You know, I want 12%. I want 10%. Well, do the math first. Mm. What is that? What's the difference in that? They make, you make a million dollars and they decide to pay you 15% or they pay you 10%, you know, and you arguing over the percentages, but when you do the math, what are the numbers? Mm. Okay. Yeah. You save $50,000, but you, you got the deal done. 
You know what I mean? And you still walked away with nine hundred thousand, nine hundred fifty thousand dollars. So I try to give them real life examples, but from an entrepreneurial standpoint, and every deal is different. So anytime someone says to me, "Oh, this every this is how we do business. We don't change anything. This is every every deal can be changed." You know, there's certain ways you got to get it done, but you got to know who you're talking to, who has the power to get that deal done. And 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 also you always negotiate. This is a tip for them. When you send out, you make them as best as you can put that deal numbers on the table first, because that becomes your floor. When somebody says, send me a proposal, that becomes your ceiling. Yeah. So, I mean, so you, are, you can't, you can't, you can't, you negotiating against yourself. I'm not going to negotiate against myself. Mm. I come to the table. I say, yeah, but make an offer. Well, they make the offer now. Okay. I know I'm not getting less than that. We going up from there. If I come with the number, you're going to start negotiating me down. Classes in session with mm-hmm. Mr. Ed Woods. Yo, know, I'll tell you one thing. I learned a lot from you today. And mm-hmm. I'll tell you, you know what I learned? I learned you don't talk in the elevator. Okay, so I'm not going to talk in the elevator no more. You know, you said uh, one time and quote me if I'm wrong, but you said anything that is not nailed down is mine. And anything that I can pry loose is not nailed down. Mm -hmm. Explain that a little further. Uh, Well, that's a a quote um, that they use from a a, a road. a legendary um, railroad baron used mm-hmm. um, is the find under John Henry. But basically what it's saying is that you, no matter if a di- it's basically you, you, you go into the extent that you're going to basically go out there and with all your drive to win, but you're going to take also which you can take. And if it's not, if you can get it loose, then you actually going to go after that too. So you're you're taking it a little further than just I'm going to go out and make a deal or whatever or close this particular matter. I'm going after every bit piece of business that I can get. If it's if it's if it's not closed, locked down, and if it's locked down, but I can pry it loose, then it was never really closed. So that's why I always say if you're going to close a deal, make sure you you close it. Nowadays it's wires, but make sure the check comes in, the <laughs> check try, clears. Try to wire yeah, in. everything's clear before you start celebrating and high fiving and patting asses in the ends before you get in the end zone. Now let me ask you, uh, what do you think about three sixty deals today? I mean, they are what they are. I mean, three sixty deals. Just you know, for um, those that don't really know what they are, is basically the opportunity for the record companies to share in revenue. Um, different buckets of income when at the offset of when when the, the music business was declining, they felt like, OK, we're funding these artists um, to go out. They putting out their records, radio, we're spending money marketing, all these things. And they're going out doing shows. They're getting book deals. They're getting film deals, television. Sure. But we're making them stars. So this whole thing of 360 deals actually came about because of that. Now, the difference is that the policing of a 360 deal doesn't mean I've yet to see a record company sue an artist for not paying them because they can't police it, especially on a certain level. Now, what you find is where the 360 deals did work is on the massive level like the Hannah Montana's, which has started from the Disney space. And then you saw deals that were happening with, you know, Live Nation building these deals with, you know, guys like Jay-Z and whatever. They share in different revenue streams and they pay them a shitload of money up front to be able to part of the touring. They finance the albums. They do whatever. But like the, these up and coming artists, not even just up and coming, mediocre, medium artists, successful artists. You know, I go out and do a walkthrough. I'm not cutting you a check. You know, and so it, so there's ways to get around it and say that you can carve the rights back so far back that they really don't get anything out of it. Can you give us a short rundown of some of the people you've represented? Represented or currently represent? Represented, you know. Just... Uh, represented. <laughs> I've I've kind of run the gamut. Uh I've worked with Michael Jackson. I've worked with Prince. I've worked with Stevie Wonder. Um, all of those incredible highlights. I've worked with a tribe called Quest. There's a plug. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I work with nowadays. I spend a lot of time working with a young man by the name of Earl Sweatshirt, uh, Vince Staples, up and coming artist named Pell, 
And um, one that's really close to my heart is uh, the estate of Notorious B.I.G. Uh, I, I kind of fight each and every day to, to maintain that gentleman's legacy and make sure his family is okay. That's an illustrious career. Illustrious. The fancy words. I don't know about illustrious. Is it, no, I, <laughs> I mean, it is. It's like it's that's, that's some top tier talent right yep. there. Um, do you ever feel – I mean, what's that – you know, representing Big's legacy, what is that feeling? Do you ever get nervous about it, or is it, is it pride? Is it you worry about the details? Always worry about the details, but I think it's a combination of pride and a little anxiety. Yeah. I think every lawyer needs that um, because, you know, when I was in undergrad at Howard University, I was listening to B.I.G., and it's like now I'm trying to negotiate deals to ensure that, BIG is protected and ensure that Tiana and CJ are, you know, properly taken care of as a result of, you know, the work he made before he passed away. So I work closely with Miss Wallace, Valetta Wallace, his mother, and work closely with uh, Faith Evans, his widow. So definitely a little anxious every time you get the piece of paper because this is not, you know, the run of the mill artist, even though I I don't I don't slack on the run of the mill artist, but you know, <laughs> this is BIG. This this is huge. Uh, but the same thing goes for Tribe. Tribe is an incredible brand with an incredible legacy, and, um, you know, you can't cut corners, right. especially with folks who know their business. I, I'm not a litigator, um, but I have no problem litigating. Yeah. So, you know, my firm has tons of litigators, and I've definitely, you know, tapped someone on the shoulder or walked down someone's office like, hey, we need to jump on this. Time you know, to go. Yeah. Suit up. <laughs> I, have no, I have no problem with that. While, while I always try to keep, you know, a good relationship with record labels, publishers, studios, networks, um, at the end of the day, I represent the client. And that's that's why I got into business. There has been so much change from in, within the structure of a business deal uh, for an artist from 1996 to, like, now the present, 2015. What do you find are still the fundamental similarities of what existed then to what, what what's happening now? Well, it's an interesting question because, to be honest with you, contracts are the same contracts. You look at a recording agreement from 1996, it's the same recording agreement 2015. There may have been some provisions added to, you know, account for streaming rights mm -hmm. or account for you know, different distribution channels and things. But the bulk of the agreement, the exclusivity, the term, the services, the advances, the record royalties, that's the same thing. And oftentimes those numbers are actually not bumped up that much. You know, at this, I mean, there are folks still getting 13, 14 point royalties. Mm. Those were royalties in 96, you know, 10, 11 point royalties. And so the music business has been slow to embrace change. Um, and I think you know, the only way it will embrace change or it has been forced to is with all these technologies and artists being able to, you know, take the technology and take more control of their career. And where, you know, what I sort of pride myself on is helping artists through that process. I'm not, I'm not chasing the record label. I'm not chasing the publisher. Mm -hmm. I'm like, you know, we can do this on our own. It's great to have a to have a partner, you know. Record label at the end of the day is a partner, supposed to be a partner, um, but oftentimes it's just a bank. You know, they're just giving you a, a loan, super high interest loan, because everything is recouped from that little royalty. Mm -hmm. uh, so, but honestly speaking, man, the recording agreement, the publishing agreement, you know, which are pretty much the two largest deals in the music business yeah. um, for a recording artist, it's the same deal, man. What in the decline, some may look at the business as declining mm -hmm. in terms of just record and album sales specifically. Yeah. And you representing a lot of uh, people from the hip-hop genre mostly. Uh, the album sales for a hip-hop artist are not that high. Mm -hmm. um, I think Tyler's first week was like maybe 23000 for um, Cherry Bomb. I'm not really... Even Earl's mm -hmm. uh, numbers are somewhat low. Yep. Um, so... What do you tell clients coming through the door who had big aspirations of, like, making trillions? Yeah. 
how what do you tell them to help maybe get them to you know a realistic perspective in in developing a plan that's really going to um make them financially uh successful but also um set them up outside of maybe just relying solely on album sales yeah let well let me take that in two parts yeah. first let me just kind of talk about the state of the music business or recording music business and then talk about how I advise clients so the state of the music business if you're talking about recorded music um there are six revenue streams but recorded music you know there's physical sales there's digital sales there's advertising there's subscription there's sync licenses and then there's performance rights four of those things have pretty much come about in the last 10 years. So, you know, when people talk about the music business or recorded music business is dying or in decline, I'm like, I don't know about that. I think the ecosystem has changed Mm -hmm. and you have a lot more different pots and like publishing, you're making money from a lot of smaller, smaller increments, you know, more pennies and nickels. Whereas the recorded business was used to making money at the 1699 CD. Yeah, that doesn't exist. But, you know, from the streaming side, especially with the indie artists, there's some real money to be made there. You know, there's real money in Sound Exchange. Sound Exchange is giving out billions of dollars. That revenue stream did not exist 15 years ago. Like, it just wasn't there. It's just all new money. Um, Can you explain what Sound Exchange is for people who don't know? Sound Exchange, the best way to explain it is um, a performance rights organization um, like a BMI or ASCAP for online radio and satellite radio. So the same way BMI and ASCAP collects money from terrestrial radio, your, I don't know, WKYS or whatever station, they have some incredible algorithm that none of us understand. (laughs) They go and collect money and pay it to writers. But what SoundExchange does, it does a very similar thing for for online radio and satellite radio, but it also pays the performers of those songs. And for those who don't understand, there, you can have a difference between a performer and a writer. So, like, Whitney Houston was the performer of I Will Always Love You. Dolly Parton was the writer. In the United States, on terrestrial radio, performers don't get paid. Only the writers get paid. But Sound Exchange actually pays the performer. And this is just this is just new money. I mean, Everyone is happy when they see a sound exchange. <laughs> so, you know, does that does that answer the, the question for sound exchange? Oh yeah, no, it it does. Yeah, I mean NPR oper- it operates differently, but mm-hmm. yeah, we've we've dealt with sound exchange a lot. Gotcha. Um, so, you know, as far as the recorded music business, I think um, I think it's actually healthy. I think for the labels, it's not as healthy because the revenue – they don't control all the revenue streams like they once did. Mm-hmm. You know, previously, they didn't control touring mm-hmm. and merch, and that was pretty much it. And sometimes they controlled merch. So it was really just touring. But now, you know, an indie artist can control all of this and just do a deal with you for their recorded music. That's what we did with Earl. You know, that, that's the deal. So, you know, I, I just think it's a different world. I think that's kind of been, been blown out, blown out of the war, blown out of proportion. As far as what I advise clients when they when they come in, um, first of all, I manage expectations. Trillions of dollars in in any job <laughs> <laughs> is you know is um, is pretty um, unless pretty you're Dolly ambitious. Parton or Whitney Houston. Forget about it. But there's you know there's so many artists and there's so few. I mean, I'm I'm never trying to crush anyone's dream. I'm totally behind you. I'm at your studio sessions. I'm at your house. I go to your project and pick you up. I'll do whatever you need. But I'm like, hey, <laughs> you know, and it has, to, it has to start with really good music. But I, I try to inform people, inform, especially young kids. And oftentimes I'm dealing with first generation wealth. I educate them through the process. So I'm giving them Don Passman's book, All You Need to Know About the Music Business. I have them reading Billboard. You know, I have them, you know, going over their contract. We do abstracts of the contract, but I want you to go through, ask as many questions as possible, and just keep them educated on on what's going on. Uh, And just, you know, tell them that short money and all money is not good money. Hmm. That's probably the biggest lesson you can tell them. Short money and all money is not good money. We talked about this before, about ways that a lot of Ali's friends act right, do right by 
the, the musicians that they work for. Mm-hmm. Why are there so few of you? What can we do to replicate you um, in the industry? Why, like, it's confusing, honestly, to me. Yeah. I get it. Record company people are shady and everything. <laughs> yeah. But, like, are, when you were coming up, were there people around you that had similar priorities? Why are you, like, a rare beast in this world? Uh I think, um, well, one, I was trained by someone who truly cared about artists and their rights. Mm -hmm. You know, he kind of viewed his job as like civil rights. He was like, this is the new form of civil rights. You know, previously, our intellectual property was stripped from us. And, you know, this is a way to empower our people and our community. So, you know, part of that was just training, you know, um, and then even, you know, my second mentor, Daryl Miller, the reason I moved out here, just really big on ownership. So I had people around me who understood the value of advocating and, of uh, you know, helping artists throughout their careers, not just getting a check. You know, a lot of, a lot of people in the music business specifically, well, actually entertainment, are about getting a check and how fast can they get that check and keep it moving. These people just disappear. There's folks that just kind of go in and out of people's lives. Um, and that's, you know, that's just not how I operate. You know, that's, I'm, I'm, uh, I was trained and it was instilled in me that you help people throughout their career, through the ups and downs. There's going to be time where we're not making any money. I'll still answer your phone call. You know, we'll, we'll figure it out. We're going to figure things out. Um, and I think that just comes down to training. Some of it just comes down to greed and some of it just comes down to what you value. You look concerned. No, I'm just like, hmm, I'm happy, actually. <laughs> <laughs> That's his happy face. That's my happy face. <laughs> I'm not concerned. I'm like, yeah, true. I, everything he's saying that I know, just from my personal uh, personal and business relationship with Julian, is is everything that he's saying is 100. And um, I've dealt with several attorneys, and some have been very, very good. And there have been a couple that, you know, sour the taste a little bit. But, you know, um, it, it's it's when you get presented with this opportunity, it's not like um, there is a, a reference that artists can go to and say, OK, this group of uh, attorneys – or firms or business managers as, as well. Yeah, they're on the up and up, and, the, the, and these not so much. So why not? Why isn't that on the internet? I don't, I don't know, understand. but just, why don't we just put it on the internet? Just speaking about it, I was like, oh yeah, maybe we need to do an Angie's list, but you yeah, call it exactly. a Shahid's list for <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yep, for in. uh, entertainment. Those aspiring to enter into the entertainment world because um, it is there's a lot you don't know, and you take a lot of trust from you know people like yourself and, you know, um, who tell you that they're there to represent on your behalf and to really give you guidance on things you don't know. You don't know anyone. You're 18. You know absolutely nothing about mm-hmm. a contract and all the intricate uh, language within. And uh, the other responsibilities and duties I think that one is signing on for is yeah. just you're, you're, you're signing on for – this is my dream. I'm about to just go in the studio. I'm getting paid to do something that is was a pastime or something maybe I did take seriously, and that's all I need in my life. And, oh yeah, I'm gonna be able to take care of mom with that. Cool. Mm-hmm. Like I'm good. Good money. Yeah. Hand, tell me what, what do I need to sign? What do I need to do? And there's such a there's a lot more that, to it than that. And so you know it's left up to your manager and your attorney, hopefully to. And really give you some good guidance, and when you don't get that, it's it's difficult because you ultimately will spend many years mm-hmm. trying to recover from those mistakes. And so, um, maybe maybe I don't know. So somebody after this can set up some sort of uh, database to give the thumbs up or the thumbs down. But it's not really about that. Um, yeah. Well, what are Maybe we can do some of it right now. Yeah. What are the most common, like, contractual tricks to jack you? <laughs> Contractual tricks. 
Hmm. How do people get got most commonly? I mean, people get got most com- most commonly because of just time pressure. Okay. You know, um, they're very excited. This is their dream. And someone just pushes a document in front of them and is like, hey, man, we got to close this. We got we to knock this out now. Hmm. You know, we're supposed to be shooting a video next week. Right. And it's really that pressure, this, fo- this person thinking, my dream is on this piece of paper. Right. So that's really a lot of times you'll have the, the I mean an average entertainment lawyer knows you know what comments to make and what to look out for. However, if your client does not want to go to the mat and your client is just ready to concede right off the bat, even though you're explaining to them because they were worried that the opportunity will go away. Yeah, they're concerned the opportunity will go away. You know. Got it. Um, but I mean, it's the big thing that the term, I think oftentimes terms are not meaning the length of the contract is not fully explained to clients. They don't really understand. This could be a 20 year agreement. This could be a 10 year agreement. You know, this could be a nice chunk of your, your life. And I don't think, um, that's properly explained to clients oftentimes, you know, just how royalties are calculated. And all of the deductions and that really everything comes out of your 14 points or 15 points. and um, But that's the same old story. It's really been going on for a very long time. I think um, one, of the, one of the most important things is to effectively communicate that you have options. Right. Because here's the thing. You know, nowadays, labels, production companies find artists. So... You know, when I first started, when I wanted to be a rap star a long time ago. Yeah, we're going to come back to that. I, I went to every single record label with my demo. You know, you did auditions and you did that whole thing. Um, <clears throat> the world has kind of shifted now. And labels will tell you, you know, let us find you. And they're finding you via YouTube, Twitter, Vine, just buzz on the blogs and everywhere else. And when you think about it, that means you have some sort of leverage because they're coming to you. And I don't think it's an enormous amount of leverage oftentimes. It isn't like, you know, in Bay Area, somebody sold 100,000 units and they've locked down this region. But this person has some audience and they have something that can be monetized. And I think oftentimes just that time pressure, it just it, it jams them up. Do you think that's, that's ever real, like time to ride the wave? Or is it usually manufactured? Ninety percent of the time is manufactured. That's fucked up. Ninety percent of the time is manufactured. It's just, and it's actually where I don't only do music. I also do TV and film work. And in the reality space, oh my gosh, these people put something in front of you, you know, the day of, like, hey, this needs to be signed right now. And you're like, wait, what do you mean this needs to be signed right now? I'm about to tape for national television. My family's going to see this. This could impact potential jobs, relationships, my children. No, this needs to get signed right now, or you're not going to be on a show. That's dirty. Mm. Like that's 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 a little crazy, but um, crazy world we live in. What happens if somebody like pre- like presents themselves in a way, gets gets a deal, and then changes their mind? Like decides they want to go a different route, they want to yeah. switch their style. What kind of recourse do they have? There, are, it's a signed artist now. Yeah. To signed artists, you completely change your your sound. Mm-hmm. And if the label's not really feeling it, um, they can either drop you, they can try to ride it out, and let's, let's just see what happens, or they can just sit on you. Right. You know, there's a whole bunch of artists that are just sitting on labels, coming tax write-offs. Um, they are tax write-offs? They are tax write-offs. How? That those dollars that are being spent on them is being used as some sort of deduction. What dollars are being spent on them while they're sitting? Studio time and any advances that they've already received. And advances can encompass everything from your initial signing advance to meals to flights. Your van. <laughs> your van. It's – it's uh, you can just be sitting for a while. It's pretty rough. How common are confidentiality agreements? In what? I guess if I, as a reporter, were to go try to talk to a bunch of shelved mm-hmm. artists, yep. would they be free to speak with me or would yes, they? Yes, they can speak with you. Okay. Go for it. 
Okay. Great story. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll serve up a few of them. All right. <laughs> Progress. <laughs> Can we go back to you shopping your demo? Oh, man. That's slightly embarrassing. No, I don't think so. Um, what do you want to know? Um, how old were you? Did you dress up? What did your <laughs> music sound like? Um, did you like have a track list? Oh my gosh. Um, what did people say? Well, <laughs> I had a few different iterations because I worked with different people. Okay. Um, well, let me say this. I'm, I'm from Long Island. I'm from mm -hmm. Long Island, New York. I grew up in three little towns, Amityville, North Babylon, and Wine Dance. And, um, Shout out to Cedric Shine, our social media manager, Amityville. Oh, okay. I grew up in Long Island. Hip-hop was, like, everywhere. Um, Dave from De La Soul used to cut my hair. He would come by my house and cut my hair. Yeah. Um, Mace, I remember Mace playing plug tuning as a demo, like, at the house. It was just crazy. Rakim was riding his Pearl White Benz around the neighborhood. EPMD was around. Like, it was hip-hop was deep in Long Island. Fife used to be on Amityville all the time. I think he had some girlfriend or something. He was always in the Ville. It was crazy. Um, so I think it was, I was submerged in that, so I wanted to be a rap artist. And, you know, I'm trying to think of what point in time. At one point, I did a demo with like, Professor Griff. We did really? something. My rap name was Educated Youth. It's horrible. Uh, it is, that's like that's like a Wu-Tang name generator name. Like, it, was, it was bad. My stuff sounded like that Tupac record, Trapped. That's what my stuff sounded like. You know they got me trapped in this prison of seclusion. Happiness living on the streets is a delusion. Even a smooth criminal one day must get caught. Shot up a shot down with the bullet that he brought. Now I'm in the kicking, thinking about what this should do to me. Because they never do. He wasn't fully developed yet. You know, he was still working on his craft. His rhymes were like, dun, dun, dun. That was, that's what I sounded like. And how old were you? I oh, mean, I started when I was like 12. Yeah, I was like 12, 13. Um, made a whole bunch of music. Got at um, Charlie Marauder's studio. Mm -hmm. Charlie did the first two EPMD albums on Long Island. Charlie's a wild dude. Uh, <laughs> made some records with him. And um, who else did I work with? I worked with somebody else, man, some crazy Long Island folks. But I wanted to be a rap star. That was the dream. Nobody, nobody signed me. So you went around, like, in Manhattan? Oh, I went around. Yeah, I went everywhere. I went to Jive. I went to um, Profile. I went to Wild Pitch. Now, in hindsight, I'm like, man, I'm so happy I didn't sign with some of those <laughs> labels. I mean, Wild Pitch and Profile, you know, Sleeping Bag Records, that's tough. Next Plateau, that's tough. Um, but, yeah, I mean, the process itself, I think, well, first of all, it was just invaluable. I met people. There, Those people are still in the music business, which is crazy. Like, they should definitely be doing something else. But, you know, those same folks, like Barry Weiss, who was at Jive, is – you know, now starting something over at Songs Music. Like, he's still in the music business. Um, it's amazing. Um, Wait, why should they not be in the business anymore? Because the business has changed? Because they, like, missed the boat on the changes? No, no. I, I mean, I think those guys did really well, many yeah. of them. I'm just surprised that um, that they've been able to last with such enormous change. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a, it's a testament to them, whatever okay. they pulled off. Um, but you're talking about this is like it's before I graduated high school. It's like 92, 91. And those same executives are, are telling kids, this is cool. Let's put it out like this. Let's market it like this. It's a, you know, it's, it's a little, little interesting. Yeah. Uh, you know? The testament to them. I mean, that's, well, whatever. That's another good story. <laughs> I guess. But, yeah, you know, didn't work out. The funniest meeting I ever had was at um, First Priority. You know, me and my cousin Malik, our rap name was Squad 44D. I don't know what that means. We didn't know what it meant then. That was just a number you liked the sound we just of? Lo we loved it. Okay. <clears throat> we went. I think their office was on Atlantic Avenue in Brooklyn. Where? Atlantic and what? Brook I don't know. I don't know. My One of our aunts took us. We didn't drive. <laughs> we didn't take the train. Like kids in Long Island, you know, you don't really take the train except to go to Jamaica Avenue or something. So we um we went. We didn't have a demo at this time. We had a 45 and had like some James Brown beat. 
we put the 45 on and rap for him. <laughs> and, you know, he was like, yo, y'all are really good, but you need to work on some more stuff. And he gave us some great feedback. It was, Who is it was he? Dope. He is the founder of First Priority, Nat Robinson. Who um, is? Mm. Who's uh, MC Light's dad and Milk's dad. Is he Giz's dad? Are they are they siblings? Milk and oh. Giz are. Okay. Yeah. Um. So that was that was cool. But you know what I we you know what I really walked away with more than anything else. This is when I realized that rappers were actually friends with each other. I didn't know that. Like they had pictures of like Light hanging out with Big Daddy Kane, or D Nice hanging out with Milk. They were just in there. And in our minds, we thought it was like all competition, and these guys never hung out. And you know, like Rakim and Kane has like real beef, and they would never talk. And I'm like, they're they're in these pictures kicking it. This is crazy. <laughs> I don't know. Crazy story, but it was uh, that it's a great revelation for me in my youth. Rappers got along, <laughs> so but that was it. It didn't work out, but that eventually led me to Def Jam for that summer, which eventually led me to representing artists. So you you decided it wasn't going to work out, so you go to Howard. Mm-hmm. You this is like the Puffy route. You oh. were Puffy a few years later, huh? Yeah, Puff. Um, Puff left a great impression on the university, and uh-huh. he, I mean, he did some 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 really cool. When you look at Puff's like team, you know, Harv, Derek, Ron, they're all Howard guys. Right. That's pretty impressive. Did you go to that homecoming? Which home? No. no. Oh. I mean, no. Did I go to Howard homecoming? The the legendary one when when um, was it like Jay came down? It was like ninety. That might have been what year. It was before Puff, but it was like right before Puff. I think, it, and like That's RZA came time. down, so it was like ninety three, I think. Two years before 93. my time. Okay, I got there and I got there in ninety five, but that homecoming, came, Biggie came. Ninety five. Mm-hmm. What was that? Biggie like? came to homecoming. We were at the um, Reeve Center. It was incredible. Like the the biggest rap artist well, it was about. He was like right on the verge, is just chilling like amongst everybody. He wasn't in a VIP area. I remember he had on these Tims, you know, some jeans and a blue sweatshirt and was just kicking it. And it was like, it was amazing to this day. You know, Big is just here drinking some champagne, cracking jokes at our homecoming. It's the best school ever. <laughs> <laughs> so hip hop was always like you could reach out and touch it. Mm-hmm. If somebody were interested in entertainment law, or, you know, having that same kind of feeling like I'm good at this one thing, maybe I could apply it and help some people in some way, but they can't reach out and touch hip hop in that way. Mm-hmm. What would you advise them to do? You know, or would you be like, you know what, you should go work on another project? Well, I think I I think my job is great. I love my job. I I literally wake up smiling every day, so I can't be mad at that. These are and that's not a joke. I really do love my job. My wife probably thinks I love it too much. But um, if I was, you know, if I was just getting out of law school now or considering law school, I would probably go to root of technology, you know, especially the convergence of technology and entertainment. You know, at the end of the day, Spotify is a technology company. You know, I mean, music is, is a tool of it. And it's, you know, something it, it's almost... You know, it's a product, but at the end of the day, it's a technology service company um, who is tapping into your different behavior on the service. So then they serve you, you know, what what they think you want based on what you do. And I think that's, you know, that that to me is the future. I, I think I, w- I would lean more towards that. Um, and it, it's just a wide open space. You know, technology is affecting everything. And entertainment is is not an exception to it so that that would be my way okay well what if um what about ownership are there can you still own the same things that you could own when you were signing a deal you know what i mean like Mm -hmm. likeness or any other way that you could be represented in a different in a different space maybe a space that we don't even like you don't know about yet. Well, traditionally, artists—I'm talking about music artists—they didn't—they didn't own 
their rec- their recordings. They don't own right. their masters. Right. They own their their songs. They own you know the underlying compositions. And that was their publishing. And then they did whatever sort of other deals with that publishing. Um, they pretty much always owned their their name and likeness. Well, at least for the last fifty years, they own their name and likeness. Um, but with you know recorded recorded music and physical and digital sales uh, not doing as well as record labels wanted to do, you know, they they just looked for other sources of, of income that was traditionally just held by the artists and they want to participate. And that's where the whole 360 model came from. So now, you know, we want a, a percentage of your touring. Now we want a percentage of, you know, your endorsement deals, your sponsorship deals, your licensing deals. Uh, you, the artist still owns that asset and that IP and a right of publicity, but the record label is like, we're giving you this platform we're investing money in your recording, your promotion, your marketing, so we should participate in these other revenue streams. Um, it's actually not a brand new concept. You know, if you go back to easily the 30s or the 40s, you know, record deals, first of all, many record labels were also the managers for their artists. So they participated in all those revenue streams anyhow. Um, but record labels, you know, would put artists on the road, record labels would own the artist's name and they would just put artists, you know, kind of flip-flop and, you know, switch them. And so they got all all that dollars, you know, kind of in, in the 70s and definitely in the 80s, we kind of moved away from that. Uh, and it was more, some more artist power, uh, but there was money, just the, the recorded music industry started making so much money. I think folks are just like, eh, we're not even worried about that, you know? Um and they looked up one day, and it was Napster. <laughs> it was everyone else. And it was like, wow, you know, okay, maybe we need to participate in, in these revenue streams again. But it, it's not a completely new concept at all. Right. I don't and know. I'm not against let, – let me, let, me, let me say this. I am not, I am not 100% opposed to 360 participation. Um, I know some people try to make that, that argument – like, no way, you shouldn't get anything. My my position is I'm willing to let you share in the pie if you help expand the pie. You know, if you're bringing deals to the table, I can't be mad at that. You know, but if you're just doing your job, then no, you, you shouldn't participate. You know, because you're already getting the lion's share of the income. You know, but just, just to say, hey, completely not not for it, I don't, I don't think um, – I think we should all be happy in our partnerships. Mm-hmm. The whole points thing, is that like people trying to get more points? Is that even a, a fight worth fighting? Uh, yes and no. On, on the digital side, yes. But really the arguments we try to make now is let's let's just do 50-50. I'd rather you give me less money up front and we just split everything 50-50. Let's split streaming. Let's let's split, you know, on the master side, the sound exchange dollars. Let's split the digital sales, the physical sales. Let's just split it fifty fifty. Okay. You know, to me, because the royalties with all the deductions and, you know, it gets all funky. I I'm willing to stand in line with you, <laughs> if we're really partners. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm bringing the content, and I'm bringing you know my incredible ability, and you're bringing your marketing and your your pipeline. Let's just do a 50-50. I have that discussion way more than I want 17 points over 15 points. You know, I my my first conversation with 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 artists who come into my office is like, why do you want a deal? Like why? Like what, what what's the reason? Do you just you want to be famous? You know, do you want money? Do you want, you know, to leave a legacy for your children? Like what what do you what do you really want? Um, because nowadays, you don't you don't get what you think you're going to get from a record label, mm-hmm. and I, I mean I, you know now I've done some deals as of recent, you know with brands, you know where they're underwriting the recording and the marketing and promotion, um, and we, just, we we see how it works. You know if you have a hardcore audience and they love you and you're putting out great music, we don't need to rush and to do this record deal, um, so. Yeah, I think it's great. I'm all for 50-50 deals. I think, though, um, I mean, I think there's so many different ways you can 
move through establishing yourself as an artist and, and getting a deal. But the expectation is really high for an artist. You know, like yeah. you have to have a certain amount of viewers on whatever, be it YouTube or a certain amount of followers on Twitter and, and Facebook. And you have to have developed enough of a fan base on your own before yep. a specifically a major label will will be so enthusiastic about what it. I, remember, that's what I said. They're, they're looking for you now. Yeah. Yeah. So um, it's, it's great to do a 50-50 mm-hmm. deal. For some, you're saying uh, the artist has already invested so much, so much that yeah. you know, um, it in understanding the benefits of that, whatever that partnership is, that 50 50 could work out. But I still, I hear that sometimes, and a part of me, I don't know if it's just the artist side, it's like mm-hmm. we we're, we are really bringing so much that, um, it would be nice to for the, the creators of the content to get more, yeah, more from. Uh, the partnerships, but you know. Well, here's the and, here's the tough thing, and this is what I've run into. If you have, you know, young kid, and you have first generation wealth, and you have, you know, dad who was never there, mom that was struggling. I'm watching television, and I'm seeing all these things. Or I'm on the web or on my mobile device, and I'm seeing all these things. And someone is telling me that I will give you a hundred thousand dollar check now. You know. They think that's going to completely change their life and their reality. In a sense, it might change their life and reality for six months or 12 months. Um, but it's, it's, it's often difficult to combat all of those other variables and to say, you know what? Let's just grind this out mm-hmm. for, for another 12 months. Let's get this buzz. Let's do these local shows. Let's get your, social, your socials up. You know, let's shoot these other videos. I can go get this company over here to do this. It's a really tough discussion. It's, it's, it's hard. Um, one thing that I'll do is I'll just try to find some money <laughs> for folks. You know, if that's going to a BMI and ASCAP saying, hey, got this, got this young man, very talented. Can we get a small advance, you know, against his performance income? You know, put him with the right agent to see if we can get some early shows. Um, make sure they're registered with Sound Exchange. Because there might be some money out there. Maybe do a few features. Um, you know, get get with a few brands. Maybe they can underwrite costs of some of these videos. But just trying to keep them, you know, in a good space so they don't make a desperate move. Mm-hmm. But the the whole the whole business of entertainment is based on desperation. It's all about desperation. And that that's, you know, when people have leverage and they're not desperate, they're perfect example. I have a young man right now, his name is Pell. We have uh, three deals on a table, you know. Um, shout out Joey IE Interscope. Uh, he's doing a great job. I've but seen him. I've seen him perform. His fans really, really feel him. Love this kid. Three deals on a table, um, and he's like, you know what? I don't think it's time to do a record deal. He's like, you know what? Let's revisit a record deal in six months. But part of that is his dad's an attorney. His mom's a lawyer. I mean, his mom's a doctor. His brother's in the NFL. He's coming from a completely different background and mind frame. He went to college, you know. You know what yeah. I mean? So that whole the element of desperation just doesn't exist. Right. Not to mention, he's actually touring around the world. He has some great records. He's making some money on merch and all that stuff. But it's like, okay, yeah, you're gonna give me a hundred thousand dollars. It's not gonna change my life that much. You know, his parents sat down and had conversations with him about the value of money and investment and things. So this is a very different place. Um, and I, I love it. You know, I, I love to be able to tell somebody to label, uh, I don't think this is going to work. Mm-hmm. I hate when I have to make that call like, okay, well, can we at least just get this up? <laughs> can we at least get an extra 25 grand? Or something? Mm-hmm. You know, so, yeah, different world, man. I did want to ask you your opinion on the um, the Robin Thick Pharrell <laughs> versus ah, Marvin Gaye um, yeah. ruling, in the sense that never before has there ever been a case 
where basically my interpretation or understanding of that case was that ruling was that um, the rhythmic aspect of um, the Marvin Gaye song was infringed upon. Mm -hmm. And never before in the music business that I know of has the rhythm section or rhythm aspect of a song was copy protected or copyright. Mm -hmm. So yep. what do you think is going to happen now based on that case? Well, when you're in law school, they they um they introduced this this um concept called the slippery slope. And if one thing happens, then there's going to be this slippery slope and a whole bunch of other things will happen. And there's been a lot of things in the press that this this ruling in case is going to cause, you know, a domino effect of these similar type of cases. Um, I personally, I don't think that'll, that'll be the case. You know, the Ninth Circuit is always kind of out there. Ninth Circuit is what California is, always kind of out there a little bit. And um, to me, this case really came down, to, was didn't come down to copyright law. It came down to, you know, a witness who the jury did not like. And that witness was Robin Thicke. I think his testimony buried the case. Um, and when you're talking about a jury trial, you know, my individuals, you know, and they're they're up there and they're they're making their opinions and their um you know, their views on you. And I just think, you know, I think he, he killed the case. Well we'll see what happens on appeal. I hear that Howard King and those guys are appealing it, but I don't think it'll be a slippery slope. I don't think it'll impact all these cases. I actually have a case right now in the Southern District. Uh, a biggie case. Someone is suing for a copyright infringement. We have a motion to dismiss out. Um, hopefully, we'll win. Um, New York has actually been been very favorable to to artists um, using very small portions of songs. Um, so I think we'll be good. But you know, I think this is more of an outlier than anything. Mm. It won't so, become the norm. So somebody is saying that that there's a biggie recording. Someone is saying that. The What, which I want to say was the last song on Ready to Die, produced by Easy Mo B, sampled their composition. That was a long time ago. Well, we actually have to wrap up, like, right now. But more to be continued. Cool. I had a great time. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> word, word.